Sarah had reached her thirties as a successful marketing executive, thriving in the bustling cityscape. Amidst her busy life, she longed for companionship, and Tinder had seemed like the perfect solution. Among the multitude of matches, one profile stood out. James, his profile picture radiated charisma, his bio oozed charm, and their chats were nothing short of captivating. After weeks of getting to know each other through digital conversations, Sarah and James decided it was time to meet in person. They picked a cosy downtown cafe for their first date, a quaint spot known for its dimly lit ambience and artisanal coffee. As Sarah entered the cafe, her heart raced with excitement and a hint of anxiety. Would James be as charming in person as he had been through text? She spotted him sitting at a corner table, a welcoming smile on his face. His attire was impeccable, and he exuded an aura of confidence. The initial moments of their date were perfect. They exchanged stories, shared laughter, and found common interests. The aroma of freshly brewed coffee filled the air, creating an atmosphere of intimacy. It seemed like the start of something beautiful. However, as the evening progressed, a sinister cloud began to overshadow their seemingly perfect encounter. James's demeanor started to change, subtly at first, but progressively more alarming. He demanded Sarah's undivided attention, leaning in closer as if trying to trap her within his gaze. Sarah felt a knot of unease forming in her stomach. The once charming James had transformed into someone she didn't recognize. He grew possessive, his eyes narrowing at any waiter who dared to engage in polite conversation with Sarah. He even glared menacingly at other patrons who dared to look in her direction. When Sarah excused herself to use the restroom, James' mask slipped further. He raised his voice, demanding to know where she was going. Panic washed over her as she realized that something was deeply wrong. She hurriedly entered the restroom, her heart pounding in her chest. Inside the bathroom, she frantically dialed the number of her best friend, Jenny, who had been aware of her plans for the evening. Between shaky breaths, she explained the distressing turn of events. Jenny's voice was filled with concern as she assured Sarah that help was on the way. Jenny immediately called the police, providing them with the cafe's address and a description of James. The officers, recognizing the urgency of the situation, arrived at the cafe discreetly, careful not to alert James. Meanwhile, Sarah struggled to maintain her composure in the restroom. She feared what might happen if she confronted James or if he realized she was trying to escape. Minutes felt like hours as she anxiously awaited help. Outside the restroom, James's behavior continued to escalate. He grew agitated and started pacing, drawing the attention of other patrons. The cafe's serene ambience had been shattered by his anger, and a sense of dread permeated the room. Finally, Sarah received a text from Jenny. The police were on their way, and she should seize the next opportunity to escape. With trembling hands, Sarah opened the bathroom door just enough to peek outside. She saw the police officers discreetly positioned near the cafe's entrance, ready to intervene. Summoning all her courage, Sarah slipped out of the restroom and quickly made her way toward the exit. She felt James's eyes burning into her back as she moved, but she didn't dare look back. Her heart pounded in her chest as she pushed open the cafe's door and rushed into the safety of the night. The police swiftly approached James, who was still unaware of Sarah's escape. They assessed the situation, noting his aggressive behavior and the distress of the cafe's patrons. With a firm but calm approach, they apprehended him and ensured that everyone in the cafe was safe. Sara sat in the police car, her emotions a whirlwind of relief, fear, and disbelief. She had escaped a situation that had taken a dark turn on what was supposed to be a promising date. As they drove away from the cafe, she couldn't help but shiver at the thought of what might have happened if she hadn't made that emergency call to her friend. In the end, the experience left Sarah shaken but wiser. It was a stark reminder of the unpredictability of online dating, and the importance of trusting one's instincts. She vowed never to ignore red flags again and to prioritize her safety above all else. As for James, he faced legal consequences for his behavior that evening. 
Sarah's courage in seeking help had not only saved herself, but potentially prevented a more dangerous situation from unfolding. The date that had started with promise had taken a dark turn, but Sarah emerged from the ordeal stronger, more cautious, and determined never to let her guard down again. The sinister events of that night haunted her for weeks. She couldn't shake the feeling that she had narrowly escaped a truly horrifying fate. As the days passed, she began to receive anonymous messages on her phone. The messages were cryptic and filled with unsettling details about her life. Things only someone who had been watching her closely could know. Sarah couldn't escape the sense of being stalked, and the fear gnawed at her day and night. She contacted the police, but they could find no concrete evidence to identify the mysterious sender of the messages. A sense of security had been shattered, and she felt like a prisoner in her own life. Weeks turned into months, and the messages continued. Sarah's anxiety reached a breaking point. She couldn't focus on work, and even simple errands became paralyzing. She had lost her sense of safety, and the constant threat of the unknown tormentor haunted her every waking moment. Desperate for answers, Sarah hired a private investigator. The investigator delved deep into the case, examining every detail, and slowly, a pattern began to emerge. It appeared that the anonymous stalker had a connection to the nightmarish date with James. The investigator uncovered chilling information about James' past. He had a history of stalking and had been involved in several disturbing incidents with women he had met online. It seemed that Sarah had been just one of his many victims and her escape had triggered a dangerous obsession. Armed with this new information, Sarah decided to take matters into her own hands. She couldn't live in fear any longer. With the help of the private investigator, she gathered evidence against James and presented it to the police. It was a daunting process, but she was determined to put an end to the torment. As the legal proceedings against James began, Sarah's courage inspired other victims to come forward. They shared their own harrowing experiences with him, painting a terrifying picture of a serial predator. The case against James grew stronger and the authorities were determined to ensure that he would never harm another person. The trial was a grueling ordeal for Sarah and the other victims. They had to relive their traumas in the harsh glare of the courtroom. But they stood together, determined to see justice served. James was eventually convicted of multiple counts of stalking and harassment, and he was sentenced to a lengthy prison term. With James behind bars, Sarah finally began to rebuild her life. The tormenting messages stopped, and a sense of security slowly returned. She learned the importance of trusting her instincts and taking action when her safety was at risk. The date that had taken a dark turn had turned into a terrifying ordeal, but Sarah's bravery and determination had prevailed. She had faced her worst fears and emerged stronger on the other side. The experience had taught her that even in the darkest moments, there is a glimmer of hope and the strength to fight back against the shadows that threaten to consume her. Daniel, a 27-year-old photographer with a passion for capturing the beauty of life through his lens, had always believed in the serendipity of love. He had experienced the ebb and flow of relationships, but never lost faith in the idea of finding someone who would truly connect with his soul. Little did he know that his journey to love would take an unexpected and chilling turn when he swiped right on Tinder one fateful evening. Tinder, the modern-day Cupid, had brought many intriguing people into Daniel's life. But none had left as profound an impact as Lisa, a woman whose profile picture emanated an aura of charm and mystique. Their initial conversations were a whirlwind of wit and laughter, and before he knew it, Daniel was entangled in the enchanting web of her words. As the days turned into weeks, their connection deepened. Daniel found himself captivated by Lisa's intelligence, her quick humor, and her seemingly genuine interest in his life. Their chemistry was undeniable, and it wasn't long before they decided to meet in person. They chose a quaint coffee shop, where the fragrant aroma of brewing espresso mingled with their excitement. Their first date was nothing short of magical. Lysa's eyes sparkled with an intensity that spoke volumes about her zest for life, and Daniel couldn't help but feel a rush of happiness as they shared their dreams and aspirations. 
It was in those moments, beneath the soft glow of the cafe's pendant lights, that Daniel thought he had finally found the person he had been searching for. However, as days turned into weeks and weeks into months, Daniel began to notice unsettling patterns in Lisa's behaviour. It started innocently enough, with Lisa surprising him at his workplace with a sweet smile and his favourite latte. Daniel was touched by the gesture, but he couldn't help but wonder how she knew where he worked. He dismissed it as a coincidence, believing that love had simply made her more attentive. But then, things took a dark turn. Lisa began to show up at his workplace unannounced, not just once, but repeatedly. Daniel's colleagues raised eyebrows, and he could feel the judgmental gazes. He realized that Lisa's constant presence was unsettling not just to him, but to those around him as well. The unease didn't end there. Lisa started to insinuate herself into his social gatherings with friends. She'd turn up at parties uninvited, and her presence felt intrusive. Daniel's friends, who had once been excited to meet his new girlfriend, began to express concerns about her behavior. They saw what he had been trying to ignore, the signs of stalking. Then came the never-ending stream of text messages, flooding his phone throughout the day and night. At first, he welcomed the attention, believing it to be a testament of Lisa's affection. But the messages took a sinister turn, becoming more demanding, possessive, and invasive. She questioned his every move, his every interaction, and his every thought. As the weight of Lisa's actions pressed down on him, Daniel realized that he could no longer ignore the looming darkness in their relationship. He had to confront her, to have an honest conversation about the boundaries that had been shattered. One evening, he mustered the courage to address the issue, inviting her to a quiet, dimly lit restaurant. As he gently explained his concerns, her demeanor began to change before his very eyes. Her sweet smile twisted into a menacing grin, and her eyes, once so full of life, turned cold and calculating. It was as though he had awakened a dormant demon within her. Lisa's voice dropped to a chilling whisper as she uttered threats that sent shivers down his spine. If you ever try to leave me, she hissed, I'll make sure the world knows every embarrassing secret you've ever shared with me. I'll destroy your reputation, your career, and everything you hold dear. Daniel was stunned, trapped between the love he had once felt for Lisa and the terror that now gripped his heart. He realized that he was dealing with a person who was not just possessive but dangerously unstable. He had to escape this toxic relationship, but he knew that doing so would come at a great cost. As the days passed, Lisa's obsession escalated to nightmarish proportions. One evening, after Daniel had retreated to the solace of his apartment, he heard an eerie scratching sound coming from his bedroom door. Heart pounding, he cautiously approached the door, only to find a chilling message etched into the wood with a sharp object. You can't hide from me, Daniel. Terror coursed through his veins as he realized that Lisa had somehow gained access to his apartment. How had she managed this? Panic consumed him, and he knew he needed to take drastic action. He called the police, who arrived promptly and searched the premises. They discovered disturbing evidence of Lisa's intrusion. Hidden cameras, meticulously documented notes on Daniel's daily routines, and even a shrine dedicated to their relationship, filled with photos and mementos. The police couldn't believe the extent of Lisa's fixation, and they advised Daniel to seek a restraining order immediately. In the darkness of that night, Daniel made a difficult decision. He decided to involve the authorities, seeking legal protection from the storm that had become his life. With the help of a lawyer, he obtained a restraining order against Lisa, the document serving as a shield against her relentless pursuit. The court's ruling was a bittersweet victory. Daniel had escaped the clutches of a woman whose love had morphed into a sinister obsession. But the scars of the experience remained. He had lost his faith in the serendipity of love, and his heart bore the wounds of betrayal and manipulation. In the aftermath of the restraining order, Lisa's presence gradually faded from Daniel's life, like a sinister spectre retreating into the shadows. The wounds began to heal, and with time he found the strength to rebuild the life that had been nearly shattered by an ill-fated swipe on Tinder. The experience served as a stark reminder that the digital realm 
of dating apps could sometimes be a treacherous terrain, concealing individuals with ulterior motives beneath charming profiles. But it also reaffirmed Daniel's belief in the resilience of the human spirit. He had faced darkness head on and emerged stronger, wiser, and more cautious in matters of the heart. As he continued to capture the beauty of life through his lens, Daniel knew that love might find him again. And when it did, he would be better equipped to navigate the complexities of the human heart. For now, he cherished the lessons learned from the haunting tale of Lisa, a story that would forever serve as a reminder that love, like life itself, could be a fragile and unpredictable journey. Once upon a time, in a bustling city teeming with life and possibilities, there lived a young woman named Sarah. At 27 years old, she was a professional who thrived in the fast-paced urban jungle, navigating the complexities of work, life, and relationships. Sarah had always believed in the magic of love, a belief she held onto tightly despite the countless disappointments and heartaches life had thrown her way. One fateful evening, as the city lights painted a mesmerizing tapestry across the night sky. Sarah found herself alone in her cozy apartment. She decided to indulge in a bit of swiping on her favorite dating app, hoping to find someone who would fill the void that had been growing within her. As her finger glided effortlessly across the screen, she stumbled upon a profile that caught her attention. It was a profile that seemed to radiate charm, intelligence, and a hint of mystery. The profile belonged to a man named David. His picture displayed a warm, welcoming smile, and his bio was filled with witty, well-spoken words that immediately drew Sarah in. Without a moment's hesitation, she swiped right. To her delight, the screen flashed with a match, notification, and Sarah felt a rush of excitement. She and David began chatting, their conversations flowing effortlessly from one topic to another. What started as light banter soon evolved into deep, meaningful discussions about life, dreams, and everything in between. David had a way with words that was both captivating and sincere. He seemed to understand Sarah's every thought and emotion, and his thoughtful messages warmed her heart. With each passing day, their connection grew stronger, transcending the boundaries of cyberspace. It wasn't long before Sarah and David decided to take their burgeoning relationship to the next level. They arranged to meet in person, eager to see if their online connection could withstand the test of reality. Sarah, trusting the sincerity she believed David possessed, had no reason to doubt that their first meeting would be anything but magical. As the day of their long-anticipated meeting arrived, Sarah's heart fluttered with a mixture of excitement and nervousness. She spent hours preparing herself, carefully choosing the perfect outfit and making sure every detail was just right. She couldn't help but smile at the thought of finally meeting the man who had captured her heart through their digital exchanges. The moment of truth arrived and Sarah found herself at a charming restaurant, anxiously waiting for David to arrive. When he walked in, her heart skipped a beat. He looked just as charming and handsome as his profile picture had suggested. A warm hug and a gentle kiss on the cheek sealed their first real-life encounter. But as the evening unfolded, something began to feel amiss. David's demeanor underwent a dramatic transformation. The charming and witty man she had grown to adore online was replaced by someone else entirely. He became aggressive and controlling, dominating their conversation with inappropriate comments and intrusive personal questions. Sarah's discomfort grew with each passing minute, and she couldn't help but wonder if this was the same David she had come to know and care for online. She tried to steer the conversation back to safer waters, but her attempts were met with resistance and hostility. It was as though she was trapped in a nightmare, unable to comprehend the stark contrast between the man before her and the one she had fallen for online. As the evening wore on, Sarah decided that she couldn't endure this torment any longer. She mustered the courage to end the date early, despite the disappointment and confusion swirling within her. She told David that she needed to leave and, with a heavy heart, bid him farewell. But David had other plans. He refused to accept Sarah's rejection, 
his demeanor growing even more menacing by the second. He followed her as she left the restaurant, his footsteps echoing ominously in the dimly lit alleyways. Panic welled up inside Sarah as she realized that this situation was spiraling out of control. Fear gripped her heart, and in a desperate bid to protect herself, Sarah reached for her phone and dialed 911. A trembling voice relayed her distress to the dispatcher, pleading for help as she described the terrifying ordeal unfolding before her eyes. As the minutes ticked by like hours, Sarah's pulse raced, and she feared for her safety. But mercifully, the distant wail of sirens grew louder, and a sense of relief washed over her as the police arrived just in the nick of time. They swiftly intervened, their presence a beacon of hope in the darkness that had descended upon her life. David, realizing the dire consequences of his actions, was apprehended by the authorities. Sarah, though shaken and scarred by the traumatic experience, had escaped unharmed, thanks to the timely arrival of the police. As they took David into custody, she couldn't help but wonder how someone who had once seemed so charming and genuine could harbor such darkness within. In the end, Sarah's tale serves as a haunting reminder of the dangers that can lurk beneath the surface of seemingly perfect online personas. It is a cautionary tale of trust betrayed, of the stark contrast between digital facades and the harsh realities of the physical world. And for Sarah, it was a life-altering experience that would forever shape her perspective on love, trust, and the precarious dance between the virtual and the real. In the bustling heart of the city, amidst the skyscrapers and the ceaseless hum of life, John found himself navigating the perplexing world of online dating. He was a successful businessman in his mid-thirties, blessed with charm, wit, and a life many would envy. Yet, there was one thing missing from his life. A genuine connection. John's days were filled with meetings, conferences, and deals that made him a wealthy man. But his nights were often solitary spent scrolling through dating apps in search of that elusive spark. It was in the midst of this digital quest that he stumbled upon the enchanting image of Emma. Her profile picture was a captivating sight. A woman with almond eyes, raven hair cascading down her shoulders, and a smile that seemed to promise the world. She appeared to be a beautiful and sophisticated individual, the embodiment of grace and allure. With a hesitant swipe, John initiated the connection. Little did he know that this seemingly innocent swipe would take him on a journey through the treacherous landscape of online deception. As John and Emma exchanged messages, they quickly discovered a shared passion for art and culture. They talked about their favorite museums, debated the merits of modern art, and delved into the world of literature and music. Each conversation deepened their connection, weaving an intricate tapestry of emotions and dreams. Weeks turned into months, and John found himself hopelessly entangled in the web of Emma's words. She spoke of a future together, of exploring the world's cultural treasures hand in hand. Her messages were filled with promises of love, devotion, and a life that seemed too perfect to be true. But as the days passed, the shadows of doubt began to creep into John's mind. Emma had always been elusive about meeting in person. Whenever he suggested a rendezvous, she skillfully diverted the topic, citing various excuses. One fateful evening, as John anxiously awaited Emma's response, he realized that something was amiss. Hours turned into days, and there was nothing but an eerie silence from her end. Panic gripped his heart as he stared at his phone, desperately hoping for a message or call anything. But Emma had vanished without a trace, leaving behind a void that seemed impossible to fill. John's emotions spiraled into a whirlwind of confusion, anger, and heartache. He couldn't fathom how someone who had professed such deep feelings could disappear so abruptly. Determined to unravel the truth, John embarked on a mission to uncover the enigmatic Emma. He scoured the internet, digging into every available piece of information. What he discovered left him dumbfounded and shattered. Emma, the woman he had fallen for, was not who she claimed to be. Her photos were stolen, her identity a carefully crafted lie. The real Emma, whose images had been used, 
was a completely different person, oblivious to the havoc wreaked in her name. John felt a tidal wave of anger and betrayal crash over him. He had been deceived, manipulated by an individual hidden behind a facade of beauty and charm. The promises of love and a shared future were nothing but cruel mirage, a trap laid by a virtual predator. As John confronted the truth, he realized that he had become a victim of one of the most common Tinder nightmares, catfishing. It was a harsh lesson in the perils of online dating, a stark reminder that even the most cautious individuals could fall prey to deception. The journey of self-discovery that followed was painful but necessary. John had to rebuild his trust in both himself and the digital world. He learned to distinguish between genuine connections and deceptive illusions, finding solace in the company of friends who stood by his side. Months after his ordeal, John was haunted by the memory of Emma's deceit. Late one night, as he walked through a dimly lit alley, a sinister presence lurked in the shadows. He sensed danger and quickened his pace, but it was too late. A hooded figure emerged from the darkness, his face obscured by a mask. John's heart raced as he tried to escape, but the assailant was relentless. A sharp, cold blade pressed against John's throat, sending shivers down his spine. Tell no one about Emma, the masked man hissed, or your life will be forfeit. John nodded frantically, the threat sinking in. The attacker vanished into the night, leaving John trembling and bewildered. Time passed, wounds healed, and John emerged from the depths of heartbreak and terror stronger and wiser. He returned to the world of online dating, this time with a cautious heart and a discerning eye. He knew that the digital realm was teeming with both genuine souls and pretenders, and he was determined not to be fooled again. In the end, John's story serves as a cautionary tale, a testament to the enduring human spirit that can rise above even the most profound betrayals and threats. Online deception and real-life danger may have scared him, but they did not define him. He found love not on a screen but in the real world with someone who cherished him for who he truly was. And so, John's journey through the labyrinth of online dating and the shadows of deception ended, not with bitterness, but with a newfound understanding of the complexities of human connection. It was a lesson that would stay with him for the rest of his life, a reminder that love, in all its forms, was worth seeking, even if it meant navigating through the treacherous traps of the digital world. I had been chatting with Katya for a few weeks on a dating app. She seemed nice, funny, and attractive. She said she was a student at the State University of Street Petersburg, studying economics. We had a lot in common, or so I thought. She suggested we meet at a cozy cafe near the Nevsky Prospect, the main street of the city. I agreed, hoping to finally see her in person and maybe start a relationship. I arrived at the cafe a few minutes before the agreed time. It was a cold and cloudy day in November. And I was glad to enter the warm and inviting place. I looked around, trying to spot Katya. I saw a girl who looked like her, sitting at a corner table. She had long blonde hair, blue eyes, and a cute smile. She was wearing a red scarf and a black coat. She waved at me, and I walked towards her. Hi, Dmitri. I'm so happy to see you, she said, standing up and giving me a hug. Hi, Katya. You look even more beautiful than in your photos, I said, feeling a bit nervous. Thank you. You're very handsome too. Come sit down. I ordered some coffee for us, she said gesturing to the table. I sat down across from her and looked at the two cups of coffee on the table. I noticed that one of them had a straw in it. I thought it was odd, but I didn't say anything. I smiled at Katya and tried to make some small talk. So, how was your day? I asked. It was good. I had a lecture on macroeconomics this morning. It was very interesting. And you? She asked. I had a meeting with a client. I work as a web developer, remember? It went well. I'm working on a new project for a travel agency, I said. That sounds cool. Do you like your job? She asked. I do. It's challenging and creative. 
and I get to travel sometimes. What about you? Do you enjoy studying economics? I asked. I do. It's fascinating and useful. And I have a passion for numbers. I want to be an accountant someday, she said. She took a sip of her coffee and smiled at me. I felt a connection with her. She seemed smart, ambitious, and genuine. I reached for my cup of coffee and was about to take a sip when I heard a loud voice behind me. Hey, buddy, is this seat taken? The voice said. I turned around and saw a man standing next to me. He was tall, muscular, and bold. He had a scar on his cheek and a piercing on his eyebrow. He was wearing a leather jacket and jeans. He looked menacing and angry. Ah, oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm here with someone, I said, pointing a catcher. The man ignored me and sat down next to me, pushing me aside. He put his arm around my shoulder and leaned in close to my ear. Listen, pal, you're in big trouble. You see that girl over there, he said, nodding at Katya. Yes, I do. She's my date, I said, trying to sound calm. No, she's not. She's my girlfriend, and you've been messing with her. You've been sending her messages, calling her, and now you're trying to hook up with her. That's not cool, man. That's not cool at all, he said, tightening his grip on my shoulder. I felt a surge of fear and confusion. What was he talking about? I had never met Katya before. She was the one who contacted me on the dating app. She was the one who asked me out. She was the one who seemed interested in me. Was this some kind of joke? A prank? A misunderstanding? Look, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know you or your girlfriend. She contacted me on the dating app. Her name is Katya and we've been talking for a few weeks. I didn't mean to cause any trouble, I said, trying to reason with him. He scoffed and tightened his grip even more. Save it, buddy. She's been complaining about you, saying you're stalking her, harassing her. I've had enough of it. You stay away from her, I understand. Katya looked visibly uncomfortable, shifting in her seat and avoiding eye contact. I was perplexed and alarmed. The situation was spiraling out of control. I had no idea what was going on. It felt surreal, as if I had stepped into a bizarre, twisted version of reality. Before I could say anything else, the man stood up abruptly, glared at me menacingly, and then stormed out of the cafe. I sat there, bewildered, trying to make sense of what just happened. I turned to Katya, seeking an explanation, but she avoided my gaze, fidgeting nervously. I, I don't understand. What was that all about? Who was that guy? I asked, my voice shaking slightly. Eleven. Katya bit her lip, then looked up at me with tears in her eyes. I'm so sorry, Dimitri. That was my ex-boyfriend. He's been... He's been following me, harassing me since we broke up. He must have seen our conversations on the app. I never intended for this to happen. I swear... I didn't know he would come here today. I felt a mixture of shock, anger, and concern. The realization sank in that I might have unwittingly been drawn into a dangerous situation. Karcher's behavior didn't align with the person I thought I'd been chatting with for weeks. I need to go, I said, standing up abruptly. Dimitri, please, let me explain, Karcher pleaded, reaching out to touch my arm. But I was already heading towards the exit, my mind racing with questions and a growing sense of unease. Outside the cafe, I took a deep breath, trying to collect my thoughts. As I reached for my phone to call a friend and share what had just happened, I noticed something odd in my pocket. It was a small folded piece of paper. I unfolded it to find a hastily scrawled message. Call the police. I'll explain everything. Shocked by the turn of events, I dialed the emergency number and informed the police about the incident at the cafe. They'd arrived promptly, and I recounted the bizarre encounter with Katya's ex-boyfriend and the unsettling revelation. I handed over all the messages and details I had about Katya from the dating app. A search for the perpetrator was initiated, with the police aiming to unravel the truth behind the disturbing episode that unfolded at the cafe. 
Events of that day left me shaken and cautious, re-evaluating the reality of online interactions and the people we think we know in the digital realm. Ale Two, I had been chatting with Jake for a few days on a dating app. He seemed cool, smart, and handsome. He said he was a lawyer at a prestigious firm, working on some high-profile cases. We had a lot in common. Also, I thought, he suggested we meet at a trendy bar near the Central Park, the perfect spot for a romantic date. I agreed, hoping to finally see him in person and maybe hit it off. I arrived at the bar a few minutes before the agreed time. It was a busy and noisy night in the city, and I had to squeeze through the crowd to get to the entrance. I checked my phone and saw a message from Jake. He said he was already inside, waiting for me at the back. I smiled and entered the bar, looking around for him. I spotted him at a corner table, holding a drink. He had short brown hair, green eyes, and a charming smile. He was wearing a suit and tie, looking sharp and professional. He waved at me, and I walked towards him. Hi, Emily. I'm so glad to see you, he said, standing up and giving me a hug. Hi, Jake. You look even more handsome than in your photos, I said, feeling a bit nervous. Thank you. You're very beautiful, too. Come sit down. I ordered a drink for you, he said, gesturing to the table. I sat down across from him and looked at the drink on the table. It was a martini with an olive in it. I thought it was odd, but I didn't say anything. I smiled at Jake and tried to make some small talk. So, how was your day? I asked. It was good. I had a meeting with a client. I work as a lawyer, remember? It was a tough case, but I think I nailed it. And you? He asked. I had a presentation at work. I worked as a graphic designer, remember? It went well. I'm working on a new project for a fashion magazine, I said. That sounds cool. Do you like your job? He asked. I do. It's creative and fun. And I get to express myself. What about you? Do you enjoy being a lawyer? I asked. I do. It's challenging and rewarding. And I have a passion for justice. I want to make a difference in the world, he said. He took a sip of his drink and smiled at me. I felt a connection with him. He seemed smart, ambitious, and genuine. I reached for my drink and was about to take a sip when I heard a loud voice behind me. Hey lady, is this seat taken? The voice said. I turned around and saw a man standing next to me. He was short, skinny, and bold. He had a tattoo on his neck and a piercing on his nose. He was wearing a leather jacket and jeans. He looked shady and rude. I guess, I'm sorry. I'm here with someone, I said, pointing at Jake. The man ignored me and sat down next to me, pushing me aside. He put his arm around my waist and leaned in close to my ear. Listen, doll, you're in big trouble. You see that guy over there, he said, nodding at Jake. Yes, I do. He's my date, I said, trying to sound calm. No, he's not. He's my boss, and you've been working for him. You've been carrying his stuff. You've been delivering his goods. You've been doing his dirty work. You've been a bad girl, a very bad girl. And you know what happens to bad girls, don't you? He said, pulling out a gun from his pocket. I felt a surge of fear and confusion. He had a gun. He was going to shoot me. I froze in shock, my heart pounding in my chest. This was a nightmare. I glanced at Jake, hoping for help, but his expression remained unreadable. The man tightened his grip around me, and I could feel the cold metal of the gun pressing against my side. What are you talking about? I don't know anything about this. I stammered, trying to reason with him, my mind racing for a way out of the situation. Don't play dumb with me, sweetheart. You've been involved with him, and now you're gonna pay the price, he hissed, his breath reeking of alcohol. 
I desperately searched the bar for any sign of help. But it seemed like nobody had noticed the commotion or the gun in the man's hand. Panic surged through me as I realized the danger I was in. I had to think fast. I swear, I don't know what we're talking about. Jake, tell him. Tell them, I don't know anything about this. I pleaded, turning to Jake. But Jake remained silent, his eyes cold and distant. A sinking feeling settled in my stomach as I realized Jake might be involved in whatever this was. I felt a surge of betrayal and fear. Suddenly, a commotion from another part of the bar distracted the man holding the gun. It was enough of a distraction for me to act. With a burst of adrenaline, I shoved myself away from the man's grasp and knocked the table over, causing glasses to crash to the floor. People around us began to turn their heads towards the disturbance. Using the chaos to my advantage, I sprinted towards the exit, hearing shouts and gasps behind me. My heart pounded as I burst out onto the bustling street. I didn't stop running until I was several blocks away, the adrenaline still coursing through my veins. Once I felt safe, I fumbled from my phone, fingers trembling and dialed 911. I frantically explained the situation to the operator, describing both Jake and the armed man. Within minutes, police cars descended on the area around the bar, coming through the crowd in search of the assailant. Later that night, after giving a detailed statement to the police, I learned that the authorities had apprehended the armed man a few blocks away. He was a known criminal and had a record for various offenses. They were also searching for Jake, but it seemed he had vanished without a trace. In the aftermath of the terrifying encounter, I was shaken but relieved to be safe. It was a stark reminder of the dangers that lurked beneath seemingly normal interactions. I thanked my lucky stars for escaping unharmed and vowed to be more cautious, especially when meeting people online. The police continued their search for Jake, and I cooperated fully with their investigation, hoping that he would be caught and brought to justice for his involvement in the alarming incident that had unfolded at the bar. 11. Three. I had been chatting with Mark for a few weeks on a dating app. He seemed nice, funny, and smart. He said he was an engineer from London who was working on a project in Sydney. He asked me out for a coffee, and I agreed. I was excited to meet him in person and see if we had a connection. I arrived at the cafe a few minutes early and looked around for him. I saw a man waving at me from a corner table. He looked different from his profile picture but I thought maybe it was just the lighting or the angle. I walked over to him and smiled. Hi, Mark, I said. Hi, Lisa. You look lovely, he said, standing up and giving me a hug. He smelled like cigarettes and cheap cologne. Thank you. You look different, I said, trying to be polite. He laughed nervously. Yeah, I guess the camera adds a few pounds and a few wrinkles and a few gray hairs. I forced a laugh. He looked at least 10 years older than his photo, and not in a good way. He had a receding hairline, scruffy beard, and a paunchy belly. He was wearing a stained shirt and a wrinkled suit. He gestured for me to sit down. So, how was your day, he asked. I sat down and looked at the menu. I wanted to get out of there as soon as possible, but I didn't want to be rude. Maybe he was a nice guy, despite his appearance. Maybe he had a great personality. It was okay. I work as a graphic designer at a marketing agency. We had a big presentation today for a new client. It went well, I think, I said. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. You must be very talented, he said. He leaned in closer and touched my hand. I felt a shiver of disgust. He was too close, too touchy, too creepy. What about you? How was your day? I asked, pulling my hand away. He smiled. It was great. I finished my project. It was a big success. I'm very proud of myself. That's good. What kind of project was it? I asked. He looked around and lowered his voice. It's a secret. I can't tell you here, but I can tell you later if you come with me to my hotel. 
He winked at me. I felt the surge of panic. He was not just creepy, he was dangerous. He was not an engineer, he was a liar. He was not here for a date, he was here for something else. I looked at his eyes and saw a cold, calculating gleam. He was not Mark, he was a monster. I grabbed my purse and stood up. I'm sorry, I have to go. I just remembered I have an emergency. I have to call my friend. She's in trouble. I have to help her. Bye. I turned and ran towards the door. He jumped up and grabbed my arm. He was stronger than he looked. Wait, Lisa. Don't go. It's okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. I was just joking. Come on, sit down. Let's talk. Please. He tried to drag me back to the table. I struggled and screamed. Let me go. Help. Someone help me. People in the cafe turned to look, and a couple of men rushed over to intervene. They grabbed the man, now identified as someone named Carl, and restrained him as I broke free and ran out of the cafe. My heart raced with fear as I hailed a taxi and went straight home, locking all the doors behind me. Shaken and terrified, I called the police immediately, recounting the entire ordeal. They assured me they would investigate the matter and advised me not to disclose personal information or meet strangers alone. They dispatched officers to the cafe and began searching for the perpetrator, Carl, using the information I provided from the dating app. The following days were nerve-wracking. I was constantly on edge, worried that Carl might try to contact me again or worse. The police kept me updated on their investigation, but couldn't locate Carl right away. Eventually, after a thorough search and assistance from the dating app company, the police managed to track down Carl. They arrested him and charged him with attempted assault and harassment. Fortunately, it seemed he hadn't targeted anyone else after our encounter. The incident left me deeply unsettled and cautious about meeting new people online. I became more vigilant ensuring my safety came first before anything else. It was a sobering lesson about the potential dangers lurking behind the screens of seemingly harmless online interactions. 11. Four. It was indeed a magnificent building with high ceilings, stained glass windows, and marble statues. I looked around, trying to spot Luca. I saw a man standing near the altar, holding a bouquet of roses. He waved at me, and I smiled. He looked just like his picture, maybe even better. He was wearing a suit and a tie, and he had a confident and charismatic aura. I walked towards him, feeling butterflies in my stomach. He greeted me with a hug and a kiss on the cheek. He handed me the roses and told me I looked beautiful. He said he was glad I came, and he wanted to show me something. He took my hand and led me to a side door. He said it was a secret passage that led to a hidden chamber. He said it was where the priests used to keep their treasures, and that he had found something amazing there. He said he wanted to share it with me, because he felt a special connection with me. I was curious and flattered, but also a bit suspicious. Why would he take me to a secluded place on our first date? What was he hiding there? Was he telling the truth or was he lying? I decided to follow him, but I also decided to be careful. I kept my phone in my pocket and made sure I knew where the exit was. He opened the door and we entered a dark and narrow corridor. He switched on a flashlight and we walked for a few minutes. He said we were almost there and he asked me to trust him. He said he had a surprise for me that would change my life. He said he loved me and he wanted to be with me forever. I was shocked and confused. How could he love me when he barely knew me? How could he want to be with me forever when we had just met? What was his surprise and how would it change my life? I felt a surge of fear and I stopped walking. I told him to wait and I asked him to explain himself. I told him he was moving too fast and he was scaring me. I told him I needed some space and some time. 
He looked at me with a hurt and angry expression. He said he was sorry, and he didn't mean to scare me. He said he just wanted to make me happy, and he had something that would do that. He said he had found a treasure, a priceless artifact that belonged to the church. He said he had stolen it, and he wanted to give it to me. He said it was a gift, a token of his love. He said it was a golden cross encrusted with jewels that dated back to the 15th century. He said it was worth millions of euros and he wanted to sell it and run away with me. He said we could start a new life together anywhere we wanted. I was stunned and horrified. He was a thief, a con man, a criminal. He had lied to me and he wanted to cheat me out of money. He had no love for me, only greed. He had no respect for the church, only contempt. He had no morals, only selfishness. He was a monster, and I was his prey. 11. I backed away from him, and I screamed. I screamed for help, and I screamed for God. I dropped the roses, and I reached for my phone. I dialed 112, and I told them where I was, and what was happening. I told them to hurry, and to arrest him. I told them he had a stolen cross, and he was dangerous. He realized what I was doing, and he lunged at me. He tried to grab my phone, and he tried to silence me. He said I was a fool, and he said I had ruined everything. He said he hated me, and he said he would kill me. He said I would never see the light of day again. We struggled, and we fought. He was stronger than me, but I was faster. I kicked him, and I bit him. I scratched him, and I hit him. I managed to break free, and I ran. I ran towards the door, and I ran towards the light. I ran towards the people, and I ran towards the police. I made it out, and I saw them. They were waiting for me with their guns and their badges. They had heard my call, and they had come to save me. They saw him, and they chased him. They caught him, and they handcuffed him. They took him away, and they took the cross. They said I was brave for calling them, and I was lucky to have escaped unharmed. They took my statement, gathered evidence, and assured me they would thoroughly investigate the situation. The authorities searched the area thoroughly, collecting any possible evidence that could link the perpetrator to the theft of the cross. They come through the hidden chamber and the corridor, looking for clues that could shed light on the crime. The stolen artifact was recovered carefully handled as they catalogued it for evidence. Meanwhile, I was taken to the police station to provide a detailed report of the incident. I recounted every detail of my date with Luca, the unfolding events, and his confession about the stolen cross. They assured me that they would do everything in their power to ensure justice was served. News of the attempted theft and the subsequent arrest spread quickly, catching the attention of the media. The historic church where the incident occurred became the center of attention for a brief period, with reporters speculating on the motives behind the theft and the dramatic rescue. In the following days, the police conducted a thorough investigation, unraveling Luca's criminal background and connections to similar thefts in the past. They pieced together a profile of his activities and networks, leading to the discovery of a well-organized group involved in art and artifact thefts across the region. The case gained significant attention, and law enforcement officials worked tirelessly to dismantle the criminal ring. Through collaborative efforts with international agencies, they managed to apprehend other members of the group and recover several stolen artworks and artifacts, bringing closure to multiple unsolved cases. As for Luca, he was charged with multiple offenses, including theft, attempted assault, and coercion. His criminal record and the evidence collected led to a substantial prison sentence. In the end, the swift action taken by the police and the courage shown by the victim led to the dismantling of a criminal operation and the recovery of precious cultural treasures. The incident served as a reminder of the importance of vigilance and the role of law enforcement in preserving our heritage. The victim, though shaken by the terrifying experience, found solace in the fact that justice prevailed. She continued with her life 
grateful for the support she received and the bravery she found within herself to stand against wrongdoing. The authorities expressed their appreciation for her bravery and quick thinking, acknowledging that her actions not only saved her, but also aided in dismantling a significant criminal network. It was a story that highlighted the strength of individuals in the face of adversity and the dedication of law enforcement to protect and serve the community. 11. Five, I had been single for a while and decided to give online dating a try. I downloaded a popular app and created a profile, hoping to find someone compatible. I swiped through dozens of profiles, but none of them caught my eye until I saw him. His name was Jake, and he had a charming smile and piercing blue eyes. His bio said he was a lawyer, 28 years old, and loved movies and music. He seemed perfect for me. I swiped right and waited for a match. To my delight, he swiped right too. We started chatting and I hit it off right away. He was funny, smart and polite. He asked me about my hobbies, my job and my dreams. He seemed genuinely interested in me. He also complimented me on my photos and said I was beautiful. We exchanged phone numbers and decided to meet in person. He suggested going to a movie theater, which I agreed to. I love movies, and it was a safe and public place for a first date. He said he would pick me up at 7 p.m. on Friday. I was nervous and excited as I got ready for the date. I wanted to make a good impression on him. I wore a simple black dress and a red scarf. I applied some makeup and perfume. I checked myself in the mirror and smiled. I looked good. He arrived on time and texted me that he was outside. I grabbed my purse and went to meet him. He was waiting by his car, a sleek black sedan. He looked even better than his photos. He wore a navy blue suit and a white shirt. He smiled when he saw me and opened the door for me. Hi, Sarah. You look amazing, he said. Hi, Jake. Thank you. You look great too, I said. He got in the driver's seat and started the car. He turned on the radio and played some soft rock music. He made small talk as he drove to the theater. He asked me about my day, my plans for the weekend, and my favorite movies. He was easy to talk to and made me laugh. We arrived at the theater and parked the car. He brought the tickets and popcorn. He let me choose the movie. I picked a romantic comedy, hoping it would set the mood. He didn't seem to mind. He held my hand as we walked to the auditorium. We sat in the middle row and watched the movie. He put his arm around me and pulled me closer to him. I felt his warmth and his breath on my ear. He whispered some funny comments and made me giggle. He also kissed me on the cheek and the neck. I felt a surge of attraction and affection for him. He was perfect. The movie ended and we walked out of the theater. He asked me if I wanted to go to his place for a drink. I hesitated for a moment, but then agreed. He seemed trustworthy and respectful. He said he lived nearby and it wouldn't take long. He took my hand and led me to his car. He drove to a quiet neighborhood and stopped in front of a small house. He said it was his. He got out of the car and opened the door for me. He took my hand and walked me to the door he unlocked it and invited me in. The house was dark and messy. There were clothes, dishes and papers everywhere. There was a stale smell in the air. I felt a pang of disappointment and unease. This was not what I expected. Sorry for the mess. I've been busy lately, he said. It's okay, I said, trying to be polite. 11. He turned on the lights and led me to the living room. There was a couch a coffee table, and a TV. He said he would get us some drinks and went to the kitchen. I sat on the couch and looked around. There were some photos on the wall. They showed Jake with a woman and a child. They looked happy and loving. 
Who are they? I asked, feeling a surge of curiosity and dread. He came back with two glasses of wine. He handed me one and sat next to me. He looked at the photos and sighed. They're my ex-wife and my son. They left me a year ago. She cheated on me with my best friend. He took everything from me. My money, my house, my car, my job, my family. He ruined my life, he said, his voice bitter and angry. I'm so sorry, Jake. That's awful, I said, feeling sorry for him. He drank his wine and looked at me. He smiled, but it was a fake smile. It's okay. I'm over it. I have you now. You're the best thing that ever happened to me, Sarah. You're my angel. You're my salvation. You're mine, he said, his voice intense and possessive. As he spoke, an uncomfortable shiver ran down Sarah's spine. His sudden shift in demeanor set off warning bells in her mind. She felt a knot form in her stomach, a growing unease that intensified with his possessive tone and intensity. She took a cautious sip of her wine, trying to mask her escalating concern. Jake, I think I should head home, Sarah said, trying to keep her voice steady despite her rising fear. His smile faltered, his eyes darkening with an unsettling mix of anger and frustration. Why would you want to leave, Sarah? You can't leave. You're here with me now. You belong to me. Sarah's heart raced. She tried to stand, her movements slow and deliberate, attempting not to escalate the situation. I really need to go. I'll call a cab, please. But before she could finish her sentence, Jake lunged towards her, grabbing her wrist with a force that made her drop her glass. Panic surged through her veins as she struggled to break free from his grasp. She managed to wrench herself away, staggering backward, her eyes darting around for an exit. With a chilling determination, Jake advanced towards her, his expression contorted with rage. You're not leaving. You can't ruin this for me. I won't let you. Sarah's heart pounded in her chest as she made a swift decision. She bolted towards the door her adrenaline-fueled sprint giving her the momentum she needed to escape. She fumbled with the lock, desperately trying to open it, all while Jake pursued her, his threats echoing through the house. As the door swung open, Sara dashed out into the night, her breaths coming in frantic gasps. She sprinted down the street, not daring to look back until she was certain she was far away from Jake's house. Once she was a safe distance away, she dialed emergency services, her hands trembling as she recounted the terrifying ordeal to the dispatcher. The police arrived swiftly, and Sarah provided them with every detail she could remember about Jake and his address. Later, at the police station, Sarah sat, shaken but grateful for her narrow escape. She recounted the traumatic experience to the officers, who assured her that they would take swift action. In the following days, Sarah learned that Jake had a history of violence and had been involved in similar incidents in the past. He was arrested and faced serious charges for attempted robbery, assault, and unlawful confinement. Though the incident left her deeply shaken, Sarah found solace in the fact that she had escaped unharmed and that Jake was now in custody, unable to harm anyone else. With a newfound caution, Sarah moved forward grateful for a second chance and more worry of who she let into her life. She realized the importance of listening to her instincts and being cautious, especially in the unpredictable world of online dating. Eleven. Six. I had been chatting with Sophia for a few weeks on a dating app. She seemed sweet, funny, and smart. She had a cute profile picture and she said she was studying psychology at the university. I was intrigued by her, and I wanted to meet her in person. She suggested we meet at her place, since she said she lived alone and didn't like crowded places. I agreed, thinking it was a good sign that she trusted me enough to invite me over. I didn't think it could end badly, because what can a cute little girl do? I took the subway to her address, which was in a nice neighborhood in Stockholm. I texted her that I was outside, and she buzzed me in. I climbed the stairs to the third floor, and knocked on the door with the number she had given me. 
The door opened, and I saw Sophia standing there. She smiled and greeted me, and invited me in. She looked just like her picture, except she was wearing a tight black dress and high heels. She looked stunning, and I felt a surge of excitement. Hi, Eric. I'm so glad you came. You look handsome, she said, as she hugged me and kissed me on the cheek. Hi, Sophia. You look amazing. I'm happy to see you, I said as I followed her into the apartment. She led me to the living room, which was cozy and stylish. There was a couch, a coffee table, a TV, and some paintings on the wall. She offered me a drink, and I said yes. She went to the kitchen, and I sat on the couch, feeling nervous but hopeful. She came back with two glasses of wine and handed me one. She sat next to me, and we clinked our glasses. She looked into my eyes and smiled. So, Eric, tell me more about yourself. What do you do for a living? She asked. I told her that I was a software engineer working for a startup company. I told her about my projects, my hobbies, my family, and my dreams. She listened attentively and asked me questions. She seemed genuinely interested in me, and I felt a connection with her. She told me about herself, too. She said she was studying psychology because she wanted to help people. She said she loved reading, watching movies and traveling. She said she had a passion for art and that she painted some of the paintings on the wall. She pointed to one of them, a colorful abstract piece, and said it was her favorite. It's beautiful, I said, admiring it. Thank you. It's inspired by my emotions. I like to express myself through art, she said. She moved closer to me and touched my arm. She looked at me with a seductive smile and said, You know, Eric, I really like you. You're smart, kind, and handsome. You're different from the other guys I've met on the app. You're special. She leaned in and kissed me softly. I kissed her back, feeling a rush of attraction. She deepened the kiss and wrapped her arms around me. I put my arms around her savoring the moment. Everything seemed to be going perfectly, and I was caught up in the whirlwind of emotions. But suddenly, I heard footsteps coming from another room. I pulled back slightly, my heart racing with confusion. Two men entered the living room, both looking stern and intimidating. My initial joy and excitement turned into a chilling feeling of dread. What's going on? I asked, my voice quivering. Sophia's demeanor changed abruptly. She had a cold, distant expression as she gestured towards the men. This is none of your business, Eric. Just cooperate and everything will be fine. It took me a moment to process the situation. I realized I had walked into something beyond my comprehension. These men were not here for a friendly gathering. They had other intentions. One of them demanded my wallet, phone, and any other valuables I had. Fear struck me as I hesitantly handed over my belongings, not daring to defy their threats. I glanced at Sophia, hoping for some explanation, but she averted her eyes. Once they had everything, the men hurriedly left the apartment, leaving Sophia and me in stunned silence. I was bewildered, shocked, and felt a sense of betrayal from someone I had trusted moments ago. I didn't understand. Who were they? What just happened? I stammered my mind racing with questions. Sophia remained silent, avoiding my gaze. It dawned on me that I had fallen into a trap, a meticulously set up scheme. My heart sank as I realized the extent of naivety I had displayed, believing in the facade of the charming girl. Without a second thought, I grabbed a nearby phone and dialed the emergency services. I reported the incident, providing the address and all the information I could remember. The police arrived promptly, but their search yielded no results. It was as if the perpetrators had vanished into thin air. As the authorities investigated, I learned the bitter truth. The apartment Sophia had claimed to live in was rented under a false name for a day. Everything about her, from her profile to her stories, was part of an elaborate setup to lure unsuspecting victims. Feeling a mix of anger, humiliation, and a lingering sense of disbelief, I left the apartment with the authorities, 
determined to put this unfortunate chapter behind me. It was a hard lesson learned about the dangers that could lurk behind a seemingly innocent encounter. The experience left a mark, teaching me to be more cautious and discerning in my interactions, especially in the world of online connections. It was a stark reminder that appearances can be deceiving, and trust should always be earned rather than blindly given. Seven. I had been chatting with Diego for a few weeks on a dating app. He seemed nice, funny, and smart. He said he was a lawyer who worked for a human rights organization. He also said he loved coffee and books, just like me. We had a lot in common. Also, I thought. We decided to meet for the first time at a Starbucks near my apartment. He said he would be there at 5 p.m., wearing a blue shirt and a black jacket. I was nervous and excited as I drove to the parking lot. I parked my car, a red Toyota Corolla that I had bought with my savings and locked it. I grabbed my purse and walked to the entrance of the Starbucks. I looked around, but I didn't see anyone who matched Diego's description. Maybe he was late, or maybe he was inside. I decided to go in and check. The place was empty, except for a bored looking barista who was wiping the counter. I approached him and asked if he had seen a man in a blue shirt and a black jacket. No sorry, no one has come in for the last hour. It's been a slow day, he said shrugging. I felt a pang of disappointment. Had Diego stood me up? I checked my phone, but there were no messages or calls from him. I tried to call him, but it went straight to voicemail. I texted him, asking where he was and if he was okay. I waited for a few minutes, but there was no reply. I started to feel angry and betrayed. How could he do this to me? Was he playing with me all along? Was he even who he said he was? I decided to leave and forget about him. I walked out of the Starbucks, feeling humiliated and hurt. But when I got to the parking lot, I couldn't believe my eyes. My car was gone. There was an empty space where I had parked it. I looked around feeling a surge of panic rising within me. I checked my surroundings again, thinking I might have made a mistake, but there was no mistaking it. My car was indeed stolen. My hands were trembling as I fumbled for my phone, immediately dialing the emergency number for the police. I explained the situation in a shaky voice, trying to keep calm while my heart raced. Within minutes, a patrol car arrived, and I recounted the bizarre turn of events to the officers. The police assured me that they would initiate an investigation right away. They asked for details about my car, any peculiar observations, and information about the person I was supposed to meet. I provided them with everything I knew, including Diego's dating app profile and the details he had shared about himself. As the investigation progressed, the police delved into the case, examining surveillance footage from nearby cameras and attempting to trace any leads related to the theft. Days passed with no significant developments, leaving me feeling anxious and vulnerable. Then, unexpectedly, there was a breakthrough. The authorities managed to track down the thief, and to my shock, it turned out to be Diego, the man I had been excited to meet. It was a disturbing revelation, shattering the image I had constructed of him in my mind. The police informed me that Diego had a history of similar offences, and had used various identities to deceive and steal from unsuspecting individuals. My car was recovered, but the betrayal stung far deeper than the loss of the vehicle. I realized that I had narrowly escaped a dangerous situation. The experience was a harsh lesson about the perils of online interactions and the need to be vigilant, even when things seem promising. Though shaken by the ordeal, I emerged with a newfound wariness and a determination to be more cautious in my future encounters. It was a painful lesson, but one that ultimately made me stronger and more discerning in navigating the complexities of the modern dating world.
8. I never thought a swipe on a dating app could change my life so drastically. But that's what happens when I matched with Lisa, a blonde beauty who claimed to be a nurse in Toronto. She seemed friendly and fun, and we had a lot in of common. We chatted for a few days, and then she invited me to her place for dinner. I was excited and nervous, hoping to make a good impression. I arrived at her apartment around 7 p.m., carrying a bottle of wine and a box of chocolates. She opened the door and greeted me with a hug and a kiss. She was wearing a tight red dress that hugged her curves, and her hair was in a ponytail. She smelled like roses and vanilla. Wow, you look amazing, I said, handing her the gifts. Thank you, you're so sweet, she said, taking them. Come in, make yourself comfortable. Dinner is almost ready. She led me to the living room, where a cozy couch and a large TV were waiting. She poured us some wine and we sat down, chatting about our hobbies, our jobs, our families. She told me she was divorced and had no kids. She said she loved her work as a nurse, but it was stressful and demanding. She said she was looking for someone to share her life with, someone who would treat her right. I told her I was a software engineer working for a startup company. I said I was single and had moved to Toronto from Vancouver a year ago. I said I liked movies, music, books and sports. I said I was looking for someone to have fun with, someone who would make me happy. We had a lot in common and we laughed a lot. She had a great sense of humor and a charming smile. She touched my arm, my leg, my hand and I felt a spark. She looked into my eyes and I felt a connection. She got up and said, dinner is ready. Come on, let's eat. She took my hand and led me to the dining room where a table was set with candles and flowers. She had cooked a delicious meal of pasta, salad and chicken. She served me a plate and said, bon appetit. We ate and drank and continued our conversation. She asked me more about my work and I told her about the project I was working on. She seemed interested and impressed. She told me more about her work, and I told her she was brave and admirable. She thanked me and blushed. I left. We finished our meal and she said, do you want some dessert? I said, sure, what do you have? She said, I have something special for you. Follow me. She took my hand and led me to the bedroom where a king-sized bed was covered with rose petals. She closed the door behind us and said, This is your dessert. She kissed me passionately, and I kissed her back. She unzipped her dress and let it fall to the floor, revealing her lingerie. She was stunning, and I was speechless. She pushed me to the bed and climbed on top of me, and for a moment, everything felt perfect. Her lips met mine, and we were lost in the moment. Suddenly, the door burst open. A voice thundered through the room. What the hell is going on here? I turned my head and saw a man standing in the doorway, his face contorted with rage. It was Lisa's husband. My heart raced, and I felt a surge of panic. Lisa scrambled off the bed, trying to explain, but he didn't listen. He lunged towards me, his fists clenched. Before I could react, he struck me hard across the face. The force of the blow stunned me, and I fell back onto the bed. I tasted blood in my mouth as he landed another punch on my side. I tried to shield myself, but the assault continued. Lisa was screaming, pleading with him to stop, but he was beyond reason. Eventually, he grabbed me by the collar and threw me towards the door. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I stumbled out of the apartment barely managing to grab my jacket and phone on the way out. As I hurried down the hallway, I could hear the commotion behind me and the sound of things being thrown around. I made it outside, my head spinning from the encounter. I hailed a cab and went back to my place, trying to make sense of what just happened. My cheek was swelling and my side throbbed with pain. I felt a mix of anger, confusion and disbelief at the situation. The next few days were a blur, I debated reporting the incident to the police, but hesitated, not wanting to get involved in someone else's mess. I didn't hear from Lisa, 
and I try to move on, focusing on work and trying to forget the unsettling events. Then one night, as I lay in bed scrolling through my phone, I saw a breaking news alert. The headline sent shivers down my spine. Arson in Toronto linked to domestic dispute. The report detailed a fire in the neighborhood where Lisa lived. The investigation revealed it was an intentional act, and the authorities suspected it was retaliation from a jealous spouse. I felt a chill run down my spine as I realized the gravity of the situation. Was it Lisa's husband seeking revenge? The thought terrified me. Guilt gnawed at me, thinking I might have played a role in triggering this chain of events. Days turned into weeks, and the guilt and fear never left me. Then one day, I received another notification on my phone. It was about an arrest made in connection with the arson case. The report confirmed that Lisa's husband had been apprehended and was facing charges for the crime. Relief washed over me, but it was accompanied by a profound sense of sadness. Lives had been shattered because of this sequence of events. It was a harsh lesson about the unseen complexities that sometimes accompany the pursuit of fleeting connections. The incident made me reevaluate my approach to relationships and the unforeseen consequences that could arise. It was a tale that taught me about the importance of honesty, transparency, and the potential dangers that lurk behind closed doors. I had always been curious about online dating, but I never had the courage to try it until I met Alexander. He seemed like a nice guy, smart, funny, and charming. We matched on a popular dating app and started chatting. He asked me about my hobbies, my work, my family, and my dreams. He shared his own stories and opinions, and we found out we had a lot in common. He made me laugh and smile, and I felt a connection with him. We exchanged messages for a few weeks, and I enjoyed every conversation. He was respectful and attentive, and he never pressured me for anything. He complimented me on my photos and said he wanted to see me in person. I was flattered and excited, and I agreed to meet him. He suggested a cozy cafe near his place, and we set a date and time. I spent hours getting ready for our meeting. I wanted to look my best and impress him. I chose a cute dress and a matching jacket, and I did my hair and makeup. I felt nervous and happy at the same time. I hoped he would like me as much as I liked him. I took a taxi to the cafe and arrived a few minutes early. I looked around for Alexander, but I didn't see him. I checked my phone and saw a message from him. He said he was running late and asked me to wait for him inside. He apologized and said he would be here soon. I replied that it was okay and that I would wait for him. I entered the cafe and looked for a table. It was a small and cozy place with a few customers and a friendly staff. I found a table near the window and sat down. I ordered a coffee and a muffin and I waited for Alexander. I checked my phone again and saw another message from him. He said he was almost there and that he couldn't wait to see me. He sent me a heart emoji and a smiley face. I smiled and texted him back. I said I was looking forward to meeting him too. I put my phone away and looked out the window. I saw a car pull up in front of the cafe. It was a black sedan with tinted windows. I wondered if it was Alexander's car. I watched as the car door opened and three men got out. They were wearing dark clothes and sunglasses and they looked suspicious. They walked towards the cafe and I felt a chill run down my spine. Something was wrong. I grabbed my purse and got up from my table. I wanted to get out of there as fast as I could. I headed for the door, but it was too late. The men entered the cafe and spotted me. They rushed towards me and grabbed me. They were strong and rough, and they dragged me outside. I screamed and struggled, but no one helped me. The cafe staff and customers were too scared to intervene. The men threw me into the car and slammed the door. They got in and drove away. I was terrified and confused. I didn't know what was happening or why. I looked at the men and saw their faces. They were cold and cruel, and they had no mercy. They laughed and taunted me, 
and they said they had a surprise for me. They said they were Alexander's friends, and that he had set me up. They said he was not a real person, but a fake profile they had created to lure me in. They said they were part of a criminal gang, and that they had a plan for me. They said they were going to rob me, hurt me, and sell me. I felt a surge of anger and betrayal. I couldn't believe that Alexander was a lie, and that he had betrayed me. I couldn't believe that I had fallen for his trap, and that I had been so naive and trusting. I cursed him and his friends, and I swore I would get revenge. I tried to fight back, but it was useless. They had a gun and a knife, and they threatened to kill me if I resisted. They took my purse and my phone, and they searched me for valuables. They found my necklace and my earrings, and they ripped them off me. They hurt me and made me bleed. They made me cry and beg for mercy. They made me wish I was dead. They drove for a long time, and I didn't know where they were taking me. I prayed for someone to save me, but no one came. I felt hopeless and helpless, and I gave up. I closed my eyes and waited for the end. But the end didn't come. Instead, I heard sirens and saw flashing lights. I opened my eyes and saw police cars and motorcycles surrounding us. I heard gunshots and screams, and I saw blood and smoke. I realized that the police had found us and that they were trying to stop the criminals. I felt a surge of hope and relief. I hoped they would save me and that they would arrest the criminals. I hoped they would make them pay for what they had done to me. The car stopped and the doors opened. The men got out and tried to run, but the police caught them. They handcuffed them and threw them into the police cars. They searched the car and found me. They opened the door and helped me out. They asked me if I was okay, and they said they were sorry for what had happened to me. They said they had been tracking the criminals for a long time, and that they had finally caught them. They said they had been using fake online profiles to lure unsuspecting victims, and that they had robbed and harmed many people. They said they had traced their phone calls and messages, and that they had followed their car. They said they had arrived just in time, and that they had saved me. I thanked them and hugged them. I felt grateful and lucky. I had survived a nightmare, and I had escaped a fate worse than death. I had been rescued by the police, and I had been given a second chance. I had learned a valuable lesson, and I had changed my perspective. I had realized the dangers of online dating, and I had decided to be more careful in the future. I had realized the importance of trust and honesty, and I had decided to look for real and genuine people. I had realized the value of life and happiness, and I had decided to appreciate them more. I had been through a lot, but I had not given up. I had been hurt, but I had not lost hope. I had been betrayed, but I had not stopped believing. I had been a victim, but I had become a survivor. I had been Maria, but I had become a new person. I had been chatting with Katie for a few weeks, and I was really looking forward to meeting her in person. She seemed like the perfect girl for me. Smart, funny, kind, and beautiful. We had so much in common, from our hobbies to our dreams. She told me she was a nurse who loved helping people, and I admired her passion and dedication. I was a software engineer who enjoyed creating new things and solving problems. We both wanted to travel the world someday and see new places and cultures. We decided to meet at a coffee shop near her place, as she said it was her favorite spot to relax and unwind. She sent me a picture of herself, smiling and holding a cup of coffee, and told me she would be wearing a blue dress and a red scarf. I replied with a picture of myself, wearing a black jacket and a green shirt, and told her I couldn't wait to see her. She said she felt the same way, and that she would be there in 15 minutes. I'd arrived at the coffee shop a few minutes early, and scanned the place for her. It was a cozy and warm place, with wooden tables and chairs, and a fireplace in the corner. There were a few people inside, mostly couples and friends, chatting and laughing. I didn't see anyone who matched Katie's description, so I decided to wait outside and look for her. I stood near the entrance, holding a bouquet of roses that I had bought for her. 
I wanted to make a good impression and show her how much I cared. I checked my phone for any messages from her, but there was nothing. I figured she was on her way and that she would be here soon. I waited for a few more minutes, but still no sign of her. I started to feel a bit anxious and worried. Maybe she was stuck in traffic or had some emergency at work. Maybe she had changed her mind or had forgotten about our date. Maybe she was not who she said she was. I shook off those thoughts and tried to stay positive. I told myself that she was probably just running late and that she would show up any minute. I decided to give her a call and see if everything was okay. I dialed her number and waited for her to answer. But instead of hearing her voice, I heard a recorded message. The number you have dialed is not in service. Please check the number and try again. I was stunned. I checked the number again, and it was the same one she had given me. I tried calling her again, but got the same message. I felt a surge of confusion and fear. What was going on? Who was she? Was she a scammer? A catfish? A criminal? I didn't have time to think, as I suddenly felt a sharp pain in the back of my head. I dropped my phone at the roses and fell to the ground. I saw stars and heard ringing in my ears. I tried to get up, but I felt someone grab my arms and legs and drag me into a nearby alley. I looked up and saw two men wearing masks and gloves holding me down. They were big and muscular and looked like they meant business. One of them had a baseball bat and the other had a knife. They looked at me with cold and cruel eyes and I knew I was in trouble. Hey buddy, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, the one with the bat said. We've been watching you for a while, and we know you've got some nice stuff on you. Your wallet, your phone, your watch, your laptop. We'll take them all, and anything else you've got. And if you try to resist or scream or call for help, we'll make sure you regret it. He swung the bat at my face, and I felt a crunch in my nose. I felt blood gush out of my nostrils and tears sting my eyes. I cried out in pain and tried to free myself, but they were too strong. Shut up, you little worm, the one with the knife said. You should have known better than to trust some random girl on the internet. She doesn't exist, you know. She's just a fake profile we made to lose suckers like you. We've been doing this for a while, and you're not the first one to fall for it. You're just another victim. Another mark, another fool. He stabbed me in the chest, and I felt a sharp pain in my heart. I gasped for air and felt my life slipping away. I saw their faces blur and the alley fade. I thought of Katie and how I had hoped to meet her. I thought of how she had lied to me and betrayed me. I thought of how I had wasted my time and my money and my life. I closed my eyes. I had always been a lonely guy. Ever since I moved to Seattle for work, I had no friends or family nearby. I spent most of my time in front of my computer, working as a software engineer for a big tech company. I was good at what I did, but I felt empty inside. I longed for someone to share my life with, someone who would understand me and love me for who I was. That's why I joined an online dating site. I thought maybe I could find my soulmate there someone who would match my interests and personality. I browsed through hundreds of profiles, but none of them caught my eye, until I saw her. Her name was Anna. She had long blonde hair, blue eyes, and a cute smile. She said she was a nurse, and that she liked reading, hiking, and watching movies. She seemed perfect for me. I sent her a message, hoping she would reply. To my surprise, she did. She said she liked my profile and that she wanted to get to know me better. We started chatting and soon we were exchanging messages every day. She was funny, smart and kind. She made me feel happy and hopeful. She said she felt the same way about me. We decided to take our relationship to the next level. We agreed to meet in person and see if we had the same chemistry offline. She suggested a coffee shop near her place.
and I agreed. I was nervous and excited at the same time. I couldn't wait to see her face, to hear her voice, to hold her hand. I arrived at the coffee shop a few minutes early. I looked around, but I didn't see her. I checked my phone, but there was no message from her. I thought maybe she was running late or had trouble finding the place. I decided to wait for her inside. I walked into the coffee shop and scanned the tables. There were only a few customers, mostly couples or groups of friends. I didn't see anyone who looked like Anna. I felt a pang of disappointment, but I tried to stay positive. Maybe she was in the bathroom or had stepped outside for a moment. I ordered a latte and sat down at a table near the window. I checked my phone again, but still no sign of her. I started to worry. What if she had changed her mind? What if she had met someone else? What if she was playing a cruel joke on me? I decided to call her. I dialed her number and waited for her to answer. But instead of hearing her voice, I heard a recorded message. The number you have dialed is not in service. Please check the number and try again. I was stunned. I checked the number again, but it was the same one she had given me. I tried to call her again, but I got the same message. I felt a surge of anger and confusion. What was going on? Had she given me a fake number? Had she lied to me about everything? I felt someone tap me on the shoulder. I turned around and saw a man standing behind me. He was tall and muscular, with short brown hair and a stubbly beard. He wore a leather jacket and jeans and had a menacing look on his face. Are you Paul? He asked in a low voice. I nodded, feeling uneasy. Who was he? How did he know my name? Good. Come with me, he said, grabbing my arm. I tried to resist, but he was too strong. He dragged me out of the coffee shop and pushed me into a black van parked outside. There were two other men inside, both wearing ski masks and holding guns. They pointed their weapons at me and told me to shut up. I was terrified. I realized I had been set up. Anna was not real. She was part of the scheme to lure me into a trap. These men were kidnappers, and they wanted money from me. They drove me to a remote warehouse where they tied me to a chair and beat me up. They demanded a ransom of $100,000 and threatened to kill me if I didn't pay. They said they had contacted my family and that they had 24 hours to deliver the money. I didn't know what to do. I didn't have that kind of money and neither did my family. I begged them to let me go, to spare my life. I told them I was just a lonely guy looking for love. I told them I had nothing to do with their business. I told them they had made a mistake, but they didn't listen. They laughed at me and mocked me. They said I was a fool and that I deserved to die. They said they had done this before and that they knew how to get away with it. They said they had no mercy and no remorse. They left me alone in the dark, bleeding and bruised. I felt hopeless and helpless. I wondered if anyone would ever find me or if I would die here. I wondered if Anna was real or if she was just a figment of my imagination. I wondered if I would ever find love or if I would die alone. I cried and prayed and waited. Days passed, each one more agonizing than the last. I had lost track of time in that cold, damp warehouse. Every moment felt like an eternity as I struggled against my restraints, both physical and emotional. But just when I had started to lose hope completely, a glimmer of light pierced through the darkness. It began with faint noises outside the warehouse, voices murmuring and footsteps echoing. At first, I thought it might be my captors returning to torment me further. But as the sounds grew louder, I realized it was something else entirely. Suddenly, the door burst open, flooding the room with blinding light. I squinted against the sudden brightness, hardly daring to believe what I was seeing. A group of police officers stormed into the warehouse, their guns drawn and expressions grim. Paul? Are you Paul? One of them called out, scanning the room frantically. Weakly, I managed to nod, tears of relief streaming down my bruised cheeks. The officers rushed toward me, 
quickly untie my bindings and helping me to my feet. It was over. I was safe. As they led me out of the warehouse and into the crisp night air, I felt an overwhelming sense of gratitude wash over me. These brave men and women had risked their lives to rescue me, a stranger in need. I would never forget their kindness and bravery. Later, as I sat in the back of an ambulance receiving medical attention, I learned how the police had found me. Passers-by had noticed something suspicious about the warehouse and had reported it to the authorities. The police had followed the clues, eventually leading them to the place where I was being held captive. As for my captors, they were swiftly apprehended and taken into custody. Justice would be served, and they would face the consequences of their heinous actions. I felt a sense of closure knowing that they would never harm anyone else again. But amidst the chaos and relief of my rescue, one question still lingered in my mind. What had happened to Anna? The woman who had lured me into this nightmare with her sweet words and false promises. Was she a victim like me, or had she been a willing accomplice in this cruel scheme? I may never know the truth about Anna, but one thing was certain. I would never again trust so easily. I had learned a valuable lesson about the dangers that lurked in the shadows, and I would carry that knowledge with me always. As I rode in the ambulance toward the safety and comfort of the hospital, I vowed to never take the gift of life for granted again. I had survived the darkest chapter of my life, and now it was time to embrace the light and start anew. My name is Andre, and now I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me in the bustling city of Moscow back in 2014. It all started innocently enough, with a few swipes on a dating app and a spark of connection with a woman named Olga. Little did I know, this seemingly charming encounter would lead me down a path of danger and deception. Olga and I hit it off right away. Her profile picture radiated warmth and kindness, and our conversations flowed effortlessly. Before long, she suggested we meet in person at a quirky themed restaurant she knew. The place was tucked away in the basement of a nondescript building, giving off an air of mystery that piqued my curiosity. I agreed eagerly, excited at the prospect of a unique dining experience and the chance to get to know all the better. As I descended the stairs into the dimly lit establishment, I was immediately struck by the eclectic decor. The walls were adorned with vintage posters and neon signs, casting a colorful glow over the space. The chatter of diners mingled with the soft strains of jazz music playing in the background, creating a cozy ambience. Olga was already waiting for me at a table near the back, her smile radiant as she waved me over. I couldn't help but feel a flutter of anticipation as I approached her. We exchanged pleasantries and dove into conversation, losing track of time as we laughed and shared stories. When it came time to order, I let Olga take the lead, trusting her judgment on the menu. Little did I know, that was the first mistake in a series of unfortunate events. The waiter appeared, pencil poised over his pad, ready to take our order. As Olga rattled off a list of dishes, I noticed something peculiar. There were no prices listed anywhere. Brushing off my concerns, I assumed it was simply part of the restaurant's charm. After all, I reasoned, how expensive could a few plates of food be? Oh, how wrong I was! As the evening progressed, our table was soon laden with an array of tantalizing dishes. We ate and drank to our heart's content, lost in each other's company. But when the bill arrived, my heart plummeted to the pit of my stomach. The total amount was exorbitant, several thousand dollars for what seemed like a modest meal. Panic gripped me as I tried to make sense of the situation. It was then that the truth dawned on me. I had fallen victim to a cunning scam. Olga, it turned out, was part of an organized group of con artists who preyed on unsuspecting individuals like myself. The restaurant was their hunting ground, and I had walked right into their trap. Anger and betrayal surged through me as I realized the extent of their deceit. Before I could react, two burly men appeared at our table, their expressions menacing as they demanded payment. My protests fell on deaf ears as they loomed over me, their threats growing more aggressive by the second. In a moment of desperation, I knew I had to act fast. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, 
I seize a nearby beer bottle and smash it against the head of one of the assailants, sending shards of glass flying. Chaos erupted as screams filled the air, mingling with the sounds of scuffling and commotion. Summoning every ounce of strength and courage, I fought my way through the melee, determined to escape the clutches of my assailants. Blood pounding in my ears, I burst through the doors of the restaurant and into the cool night air, my lungs burning with exertion. With trembling hands, I reached for my phone and dialed the emergency number, my voice shaking as I recounted the harrowing ordeal to the dispatcher on the other end. Within minutes, sirens wailed in the distance, signaling the arrival of law enforcement. As the perpetrators were apprehended and led away in handcuffs, I felt a wave of relief wash over me. Though shaken and bruised, I emerged from the ordeal with a newfound sense of resilience and determination. And so, dear reader, let my tale serve as a cautionary reminder. Beware the allure of online encounters, for not all that glitters is gold. Trust your instincts, and never underestimate the power of deception lurking in the shadows. For in the heart of darkness, even the brightest of lights can be extinguished an instant. My name is Emma, and now I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me in the year 2020 in the bustling city of New York. It was a chilly evening in October when I decided to meet Jacob, a guy I had been chatting with on a popular American dating site. Little did I know that this decision would lead me into the darkest, most harrowing experience of my life. As I stepped into the cozy cafe where we had arranged to meet, my heart fluttered with nervous excitement. I scanned the room, searching for Jacob's familiar face. Finally, I spotted him sitting at a corner table, a warm smile playing on his lips. I approached him with cautious optimism, and we greeted each other awkwardly. Jacob suggested that we go for a walk in Central Park after our coffee, and I agreed. We chatted animatedly as we strolled through the park, the vibrant colors of autumn painting a picturesque backdrop. Jacob seemed charming and genuine, and I found myself growing more comfortable in his presence. However, as the sun began to dip below the horizon, Jacob's demeanor suddenly shifted. He suggested that we go to a secluded spot he knew, away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Alarm bells started ringing in my head, but I brushed them aside, convincing myself that I was just being paranoid. Jacob hailed a cab, and we drove through the dimly lit streets of New York. I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled in the pit of my stomach and we arrived at our destination, a deserted parking lot near a convenience store, my anxiety reached a fever pitch. As I stepped out of the cab, I noticed a car lurking in the shadows, its engine idling ominously. Before I could react, a group of masked men emerged from the vehicle, brandishing guns. Panic surged through me as I realized that I had walked straight into a trap. Jacob's friendly facade melted away, revealing the cold, calculating gaze of a predator. He grabbed my arm roughly, his grip like a vice, and shoved me towards the waiting car. My mind raced as I struggled against his grasp, but his accomplices were quick to intervene, overpowering me with surprising strength. I screamed for help, but my cries were drowned out by the sound of screeching tires and muffled voices. In a blur of chaos and confusion, I was thrown into the back seat of the car, my body jostled and bruised by the rough handling of my captors. For what felt like an eternity, we sped through the deserted streets, the darkness swallowing us whole. Tears streamed down my face as I prayed for a miracle. But deep down, I knew that my fate was sealed. Finally, the car screeched to a halt, and I was dragged out onto a desolate stretch of road. The men wasted no time in ransacking my belongings, tearing through my purse with ruthless efficiency. They stole everything of value, my phone, my wallet, even the necklace my grandmother had given me on my 16th birthday. When they were satisfied with their haul, they left me battered and broken on the side of the road, a mere shell of the woman I once was. I lay there, trembling and alone, as the harsh reality of what had just happened washed over me. It was only thanks to the kindness of strangers that I survived that night. Passers-by stumbled upon me, lying by the roadside and called for help. 
The ambulance arrived soon after, whisking me away to the safety of the hospital. In the days that followed, I recounted my ordeal to the police, but despite their best efforts, perpetrators remained at large. They were ghosts slipping through the cracks of the city's bustling streets, leaving behind only shattered lives and shattered dreams. As I lay in my hospital bed, nursing my physical and emotional wounds, I couldn't help but wonder what had driven Jacob and his accomplices to commit such a heinous act. Had it been a desperate bid for money, or had they simply taken pleasure in causing pain and suffering? One thing was for certain, I would never be the same again. The scars of that night would haunt me for the rest of my days, a grim reminder of the darkness that lurked beneath the surface of the world we live in. But amidst the despair there was also hope, a flickering flame that refused to be extinguished. I refused to let fear dictate my life, vowing to rise from the ashes stronger and more resilient than ever before. And so, as I gazed out of the hospital window at the city's skyline bathed in the soft glow of dawn, I made a silent promise to myself, no matter what challenges lay ahead, I would face them head on, armed with nothing but courage and the unwavering belief that light would always triumph over darkness. My name is Michael, and now I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me in 2012 in the vibrant city of Phoenix. It's a tale that still sends shivers down my spine whenever I recall the events that transpired. It all began innocently enough, as many stories often do, with a simple swipe on a dating app. I matched with a girl named Ashley. She seemed pleasant enough through our initial chats, and we decided to meet up for a coffee one chilly autumn afternoon. As I walked into the cafe, I spotted her sitting by the window, her hair catching the sunlight in a way that made her seem almost ethereal. We exchanged pleasantries, and for a moment, everything felt right. But as the conversation progressed, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off. There was a tension underlying our interaction that I couldn't quite place. Nevertheless, I brushed off my reservations and tried to enjoy the date as much as possible. However, by the time we said our goodbyes, I knew deep down that Ashley wasn't the one for me. Her enthusiasm far outweighed mine, and I couldn't see a future with her. I thought that would be the end of it, a mere blip in the vast expanse of my dating life. Little did I know, Ashley had the plans. Days turned into weeks, and I started noticing peculiar occurrences around me. I would catch glimpses of someone watching me from afar, or I would receive mysterious texts from unknown numbers. At first, I brushed them off as mere coincidences, but as the frequency of these incidents increased, I began to grow uneasy. Then one fateful night, I returned home from work to find my apartment engulfed in flames. The acrid smell of smoke filled the air, and panic surged through me as I realized what was happening. Without a moment's hesitation, I called the fire department and stumbled out onto the street, coughing and gasping for air. It was only later, as I lay in a hospital bed with bandages covering my burnt skin, that the full extent of Ashley's obsession became apparent. She had stalked me, learned where I lived, and orchestrated this heinous act of arson in a twisted attempt to win my affections. The physical pain was excruciating, but it was nothing compared to the emotional trauma of realizing that someone was willing to destroy my life simply because I didn't reciprocate their feelings. As I underwent surgery after surgery to repair the damage done to my body, I couldn't help but wonder what kind of person could be capable of such cruelty. But life has a way of surprising you when you least expect it. Despite the odds stacked against me, I emerged from the ordeal stronger than ever. The scars on my skin healed, and though they served as a reminder of the horrors I endured, they also symbolized my resilience in the face of adversity. As for Ashley, justice caught up with her swiftly. She was apprehended by the authorities and brought to trial, where she faced the full consequences of her actions. Though I struggled with forgiveness, I knew that harboring hatred in my heart would only hold me back from truly moving on. In the end, I chose to focus on rebuilding my life and reclaiming my sense of security. I surrounded myself with loved ones who supported me unconditionally, and together we forged ahead into the future, leaving behind the shadows of the past. 
but the scars, both physical and emotional, lingered long after the flames had been extinguished. Nightmares haunted my sleep, and the fear of encountering another Ashley gnawed at the edges of my consciousness. It took time therapy and a great deal of introspection to come to terms with what had happened and find peace within myself. However, amidst the darkness, there were glimmers of hope. I discovered newfound strength in my vulnerability, and I learned to cherish each day as a precious gift. The experience, though harrowing, had taught me valuable lessons about resilience, compassion, and the importance of setting boundaries. As the seasons changed and life gradually returned to a semblance of normalcy, I found solace in the small moments of joy that dotted my days. Whether it was sharing laughter with friends, indulging in my passions, or simply basking in the warmth of the sun, I refused to let the shadows of the past dictate my future. And so, as I sit here, recounting this harrowing tale, I am filled not with bitterness or resentment, but with gratitude for the strength that carried me through the darkest of times. My name is Sophia, and now I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me in the summer of 2020 in the bustling city of New York. I still shudder at the memory of that fateful evening, the events that unfolded, and the unexpected turn my life took. It was a warm Friday evening when I decided to meet up with a guy named Alex, whom I had connected with on a dating app. We had been chatting for a while, and he seemed like a genuinely nice guy. Little did I know that this seemingly harmless encounter would turn into a nightmare. We decided to meet at a cozy cafe in the heart of the city. As I walked into the cafe, I spotted Alex sitting at a table by the window, eagerly waiting for me. He flashed me a charming smile as I approached, and we exchanged pleasantries before diving into conversation. At first, everything seemed to be going smoothly. We laughed, we shared stories, and I found myself enjoying his company. However, as the evening progressed, I noticed a shift in Alex's demeanor. His once charming smile now seemed more sinister, and his eyes held a predatory gleam that sent a chill down my spine. Uncomfortable with the sudden change, I tried to politely excuse myself, but Alex insisted that we take a stroll in the nearby park. Against my better judgment, I agreed, hoping that maybe I was just overthinking things. As we walked through the dimly lit paths of the park, Alex's behavior became increasingly aggressive. He began making lewd comments, groping me despite my protests and ignoring my clear discomfort. Panic began to rise within me as I realized that I was in a dangerous situation. Desperate to escape, I tried to push him away, but he only grew more violent. In a sudden fit of rage, Alex struck me across the face, sending me sprawling to the ground. Dazed and disoriented, I watched in horror as he rifled through my belongings, stealing my phone and purse before disappearing into the darkness. Alone and shaken, I struggled to gather my thoughts as tears streamed down my cheeks. It was then that I heard footsteps approaching, and I looked up to see a group of strangers rushing to my aid. They helped me to my feet, offering words of comfort and support as they called the police. In a daze, I recounted the events to the officers who arrived on the scene, my hands trembling as I struggled to find the right words. With their assistance, I was able to file a report and they assured me that they would do everything in their power to apprehend my attacker. Days passed, and I found myself consumed by fear and anxiety, constantly looking over my shoulder and jumping at the slightest noise. The thought of facing Alex again filled me with dread, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Then one morning, I received a call from the police informing me that they had apprehended a suspect matching Alex's description. My heart raced as I made my way to the station, praying that justice would finally be served. As I sat in the interrogation room, watching through the one-way mirror as Alex was brought in handcuffed, a wave of relief washed over me. Despite his attempts to deny his involvement, the evidence against him was overwhelming, and he was ultimately charged with assault, theft, and harassment. Though the scars from that night may never fully heal, I refuse to let fear dictate my life. I am grateful for the kindness and compassion shown to me by strangers. 
and I am determined to reclaim my sense of security and independence. So, as I reflect on the events that transpired, I am reminded of the resilience of the human spirit and the power of community in the face of adversity. And though the road ahead may be long and challenging, I know that I am not alone.